thank you for this wonderful opportunity and um, thank you to Graham Yoko and to the AE team for inviting me to share. It's lovely to be with you. Welcome to um, heads and staff of various schools. So as you can see, my topic today is um, emotions, COVID and schools. And we bring those three things together and just look at the effect of the COVID pandemic um, on our emotions and therefore on how it has affected schools as well. So the COVID pandemic, although it began as a medical one, we all know it's an economic pandemic as well, but it's also become a psychological one and it's had huge educational impact. I know I don't need to tell any of you this, but psychologists are reporting three times um, as many cases as normal that are coming, people needing counselling, um, potential suicides, people just in need, needing somebody to talk to. And many have just expressed that there's this lingering sense of unease or sadness or just that feeling of greyness as they walk into schools that don't look quite the same, shopping malls that don't look quite the same, home life that doesn't feel the same because it's not alive with, um, with guests and friends around the table. In the beginning, um, many people just said, oh, I feel so disorientated. You know, that those first few days of lockdown, if you can take yourself back to those early, those early days, you know, there was just this disorientation. And then after a while, people began to say, the sort of collective voice began to say, hey, wait a minute, where has my life gone? And many people began to express things like trouble, just focusing on normal tasks or people saying, oh, I just want to eat all the time or I don't feel like eating or I'm sleeping more than I ever slept or my sleep is disturbed. Some people to this day are, are feeling an increased sense of irritability and maybe anger. For some, there have been low energy levels and low fatigue levels. For others, there has been those who possibly had the propensity for addictions, you know, for just, just relentlessly watching movies, series, addictions, things like that. But the long and the short is that so much of life has changed in such a short space of time and without warning and time to prepare. And so if we talk about emotions, I saw this slide a while ago that said, um, I told my suitcase, that there'll be no vacation this year. Now I'm dealing with my emotional baggage. But for many, they have felt that thing that there's just their emotions have gone to a place that they just didn't, don't quite know what to, what to do with. And it took a while for psychologists to actually begin to say, you know what, the world is actually grieving. Across the world, there is a sense of loss and we are grieving. And so I'd like to just introduce my story just by speaking just about our personal um, journey with grief and then linking some of that to um, the grief journey of the, the coronavirus in schools. So in December 2017, it was actually the exact day school closed, um, and in December we got a message to say that um, our beautiful 26-year-old daughter um, Tatum had been killed in a hit and run um, in Miami. And I have learned so much about grief and loss in these unspeakably difficult, um, jo this journey that we have had to walk and still continue to walk. But you know, I wanted just to relate it, just to say that there, it's never helpful to talk about um, degrees of suffering or comparative suffering, you know, to say, oh, but you've lost a daughter. How can you compare that to a loss of what we experience in the education system at this stage? I want to say that grief is grief and loss is loss, whatever the loss is. And it's really important that we name our loss and we say what the loss actually is. And any type of loss can um, can trigger grief, not, um, not just death. Um, UNESCO has said that 192 countries in the world have implemented nationwide or um, local lockdown effects on schools and education systems. And that means that 99% of the student population of the world has been affected. 
So all of us who are involved in education as parents, as teachers, as children, as heads, have been on this great thing. I'm sure you've heard the terminology used often, the corona coaster, the ups and downs of our mood during the pandemic. And just from a school perspective, you know, sometimes we've been starting and we've seen the children and we're so excited and we, you know, and then the next thing there's this, ah, you know, schools are closing again and we just, so, um, you know, the ups and downs, I don't need to explain them to you, you know them. But these are some of the emotions that we have experienced and some of the losses that we have experienced. What um, we know the feeling of social isolation and the loss that has come from that and how our children have experienced that. We know that we're concerned for the academic loss that has taken place nationwide in, in, in um, primary, secondary, tertiary education. We know the economic loss that is bigger than the education system, but certainly affects the education system and how many heads are wondering how they're going to sustain their schools going into the future. For many, we have lost the, our sense of self-control has just been challenged at every level that we have felt that we are out of control, if I could use that term. It's the loss of autonomy where we begin to say, how can they just say, you know, you can open your school or no, you can't open your school and you must teach this way or you must teach that way. And I've realized that um, in our community, and I'm sure in your communities as well, you might notice that people have responded to that loss of control in different ways. Some of your staff and your children you would find have been over-functioning, you know, that are just desperately trying to regain that control. I've been one of those. I've just over-functioned in this time because I don't do well when control is taken out my hands. That is a toxic place as well because it's a reaction to the, con to the loss of control. But for many others, and this is, I think, where many of us um, academics are concerned for our children, is that for many, they have seemed to have just underfunctioned in this time and almost opted out. They've had no control and there has just been this not showing up, if I could say it that way, or on Zoom, but actually not being on Zoom and things like that. And so the scale and complexity of what has happened um, has just thrown us into entirely new territory. Having said all that, and I will again um, speak about some of the loss, but I want to just bring us immediately to the place of scripture. And I know you are discussing the, the, the theme of the conference being about the anchor, that in all these ups and downs that there is this anchor. And in my personal journey and my educational journey, I have constantly gone to the scripture that says, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul. And so in the early days, and even now in the loss of my daughter, I have a hope, I have an eternal hope. And my emotions have been up and down with, with the loss of a child. But for the most part, my soul has been anchored. And so with our schools, and as we navigate our schools through this crisis and this pandemic, may our souls be anchored. Um, and the way that it's, it's the hope of Christ that enables us to lead from a position um, of being anchored. I do want to, for a while, just look at the effects on um, the emotional effects on children, the emotional effects on staff, the emotional effects on, um, on parents. And um, if we start with looking at the emotional effects on children, I'd like to just say that um, in as many children as there are, there will be different reactions. So different children, different reactions. Some children just absolutely love being off school and um, being able to be at home. Whereas for others, school, <laughs> they, they, it's just been a disaster for them to, to be at home. There've been those that school is the safe place for them. We know that child abuse in South Africa is just so high. And for some, they haven't even been able to run to the shelter of their schools um, over this time. Some are completely overwhelmed by online education. So as many children as we have, as many scenarios as there are, there will be different responses. But globally, children are telling psychologists that their real fear is a fear of the unknown. 
And um, as a child looks at its future or looks at his or her future, will they be homeschooling? Will they be blended learning? Is it full-time? Is it part-time? You know, just, just what, is, what does school look like? What does home look like? And it's that fear of how long are we in this and how long is this going to go on for? But teachers and, can, and parents can um, expect an increased emotional stress in children because of the disruption. It will be different in primary school and in high school. Primary school children might feel, as you've already noticed, um, some regressive behaviors, um, increasingly clingy. They don't have the language skills to experience or to verbalize what they are experiencing. High school children as well, um, different emotions, mood swings, maybe an increased irritability, maybe a despondency because they don't quite know what the future brings. And that's particularly for matrix, wondering what their tertiary education will look like um, next year. For many, and this would be our matrix as well, it's been the loss of the rites of passages, their, um, their graduations, their matric farewells, their ability to be the head boy or the hockey captain or whatever their matric um, sort of celebratory things look like. And so they, it's, a, it's a grief, it's a loss. And this is where I get into the comparative grief and loss. You know, they, they've got roofs over their heads many and they feel bad to say, look, I'm feeling, you know, um, I'm feeling bad because I can't have a matric farewell. But for them, it's a very real thing. It's a loss of a rite of passage. And we need to view it as such and acknowledge it as such. Um, but most importantly, children are picking up on the anxiety of the adults around them, be they staff members or be they parents. I just want to say that from my perspective, anxiety is far more contagious even than, um, than the coronavirus. And we really need to caution um, how we relate to children. Because especially children who were previously diagnosed with depression or anxiety, they might find this pandemic particularly challenging um, because a lot of the keeping yourself safe sort of protocols revolve around hand washing and sanitizing, and they can for some be quite anxiety provoking in themselves. So there's an a degree of obsessiveness and compulsive thinking in just trying to keep children safe. But as schools reopen, and as we have reopened you know, progressively over the last couple of months, um, children are fearful because at the beginning of the pandemic, we told them, we're so sorry, we're keeping you home so that you can be safe. Now we're letting you out of home, and they're wondering, am I going to be safe when I get let out of home? So these are the kind of things that children are thinking and feeling and experiencing. But it hasn't all been doom and gloom for many, for the children, there have been benefits. It's been just to spend time with parents, to have the, the input of their parents has been amazing. For many, it's been a really defining time, a time of reevaluating. And I'm hoping that children are going to come out of this encounter where they have been so much on electron, electronic platforms. I'm hoping that they're going to come out really valuing their face-to-face -face encounters and their social engagements more than they were before. For many children, they have also learned increased accountability, um, self-management, and, you know, keeping themselves to routine. That hasn't been the case with all, but where it has been the case, it has been a blessing. If we look at um, parents and the effect on parents, um, you know, we all know this feeling of what it's like to feel like you're a parent in a child's Zoom class and not really quite know what's actually going on or how to navigate Google Classroom or whatever the platforms are that you are using. This is one of my most favorites, this little Ben who was homeschooling and he says, it's not going good. My mom's getting stressed out. My mom is really getting confused. We took a break so my mom can figure this stuff out. And I'm telling you, it's not going good. And I can imagine for many moms, it's not going good. I think there has been a huge demand on parents managing the pandemic, um, managing their jobs, maybe loss of jobs, housework, um, just the assuming responsibility for their child's learning. And even as many are in the blended learning phase, there's still an onus on parents to pick up responsibility. And homeschooling, I'm sure, has looked completely different in different homes. But then I'm sure for some it's produced inspirational moments. I'm sure for some it's produced angry moments. 
And again, one of my my more lovely ones is this um, this line that says, "You lied." Talking to the teacher of the school, "You lied." My kids are not a joy to have in the class. Just the increasing realization of of um, you know how their own children perform or battle with concentration or whatever it might be. But I'm sure that for some, they've been, you know, with the frustrated moments, they've been great moments of fun. But for many, the moments of awareness of um, what it's like to be with their children um, all the time. So um, it's been an interesting season for all concerned. But just a, a quick um, positive or maybe bit of advice for parents and for teachers and for principals of schools would be this thing of put your own oxygen mask on first. Every time I have ever flown, I hear, you know, when they do the air hostess does the safety protocols and she says, or he says, in case of emergency, air masks will drop from the ceiling. If you're traveling with the miner, please put your own mask on before helping the miner. And over the years I've gone, no ways. If I'm traveling with my child, I'm telling you I'm going to save my child first. But the reality is it doesn't work like that. We, as the responsible people in the schools, in the airplanes, wherever we are, we are the ones who have to put our own oxygen masks on first. We have to deal with our own stuff. We need to, I need to deal with my own grief. We need to deal with our own losses. We need to deal with our own anxiety. The only way that I know how to do that is to go to the presence of God, to the foot of the cross, to ask him for his perspective. If you are operating from a place of fear and anxiety, your staff, the children in the school, they read between the lines, they know those things. If we just continue to look at some of the effects on schools in South Africa, there are those schools who have been able to maintain the protocols. I imagine like many of your schools and um, you are social distancing, you are sanitizing, you are holding an increased responsibility for these things. And just the difficulty that comes with that, and you know how anxiety provoking that can be, just getting that right. But then we have other schools in South Africa who one wonders and whose heart just goes out and one goes, well, what about these schools? What are the emotions happening with um, teachers, with parents, with pupils in schools where it's almost impossible to get the protocols up and going? And in many cases where um, there has not been online education. And so in these cases, just the difficulty of the children um, just in experiencing the loss of momentum and the demotivation in, of what these months of without education has brought. And one really hopes that this pandemic has brought people to a place where we hope that it would stimulate change um, in these environments. But where we have been able to offer um, blended learning. I want to just speak about the effects on schools and on staff. So this is, I've just taken the liberty of enclosing a little thing that we have used at our school here. And we've had this on t-shirts and things like that. And it said, I will teach you now at school, even with the mask at school, I'll teach you in your house, I'll teach you with my mask, I'll teach you here and I'll teach you there. I'll teach you because I care. And I think that would be the echo of all of us sitting here, just the way we care for the children and we're just doing everything we can to, to give them their education for this year. But that has this slogan that we've been using and this thing and, and the, the way we've been putting it into practice, and I know you would have been as well, it has come at tremendous, tremendous costs. As we all know, we have teachers with different levels of technological abilities, um, it's been, <laughs> it's when children are on Zoom and even teachers are being well prepared, it's difficult to reach the children sometimes. They hide behind their avatars on Zoom and one feels that you can't see them and can't always reach them. The rate of change for teachers is high, it's still high. The insecurity of not knowing what the next few weeks, the next few months and next year is going to bring. And just the fact of them having to comply with the pro protocols and monitor the protocols has been really difficult. So um, this is just, again, it just taken the liberty of enclosing some pictures from our school. But on the left-hand side, you'll see our little, we call it Jacob's Ladder, just the little ones. But 
um, the, our preschool just to what, you know, what in getting the, the children to comply with their protocols actually looks like the responsibilities that the staff feel in that regard. And on the right hand side, I'm just showing a picture of one of our matric science pracs and how the teachers literally had to label hundreds and hundreds of beakers just so that there's not cross contamination and things like this. So in all the spheres, the, the responsibility and the burden that the staff are feeling to comply is quite overwhelming. But if we just speak about um, principals and headmasters, and as you know, um, I'm married to one and work closely together with them. I think many of us in leadership know what this feels like, where it feels like we need to be the color and the shelter in amongst the gray and the rain and, and that, and that there is a responsibility for us as leaders um, for the physical and emotional well-being of those in our care, the financial responsibility of the schools in these times. At the same time, we've had um, um, racial matters, um, surfacing in schools all around South Africa. And I know that we are all doing what we can to really try and build kingdom culture um, in these lands in a way that is completely pleasing to the Lord to create schools in which everybody feels that they belong. But all of these things are happening at the same time. And so for the principals and the headmasters and headmistresses there, to try to create and to transmit an authentic hope in your communities as best as you can and to bring stability and the only way I know how to do that is to go to the cross first as I said to put on my own oxygen mask to put on our own oxygen oxygen masks that we can receive the joy of the Lord and then in turn go and um, transmit that into our communities as anxiety is a contagious emotion so is calm a contagious emotion so is hope a contagious emotion and may we be the leaders of an authentic hope um, in this time. One of the things that has been required of all of us is extreme flexibility and one of my favorite um, <laughs> sayings of the, the last beatitude just you know that we can add is um, blessed are the, are the flexible for they will not be blend, bent out of shape and haven't we had to be so flexible over this time. Well, how not to do this thing and excuse this rather jarring picture, but I have felt like I have had some of these parents in my, and, and maybe uh, our staff have been amazing, but maybe even this is how some of the staff have been feeling, but certainly how some of the parents have been feeling. You know, they, they really don't want the school to start in person before it, it actually started, you know. <laughs> They really don't want to start online. They really don't want to be homeschooling. They really don't want to be blended schooling. They really don't know what they want. And they're just feeling like that. And those are the kind of emotions that get transmitted to children so quickly. But on a positive side, we have just encouraged our staff that whilst they must be rigid with their protocols, and they must be, we have a responsibility, that they mustn't be overly rigid and have an overly um, serious um, I don't know, attitude towards life at the moment. The children have already picked up more gravity than they need to. So if we can bring the levity into the school spaces and the levity into the classroom, um, wherever we can, if we can be the transmitters of joy. And um, so just little things as well help children like um, before they're about to come to school, sending them photographs of what their classroom looks like, videos where they can, virtual open days where they can, help them to go there in their minds before they get there physically. It helps to know that when children do come back to school that, and you know, they might play up, we don't need to go to punishment mode straight away. We can go to understanding mode first of all because they are difficult times. And we can look at helping children with whatever rite of passage we can give them. I met with our matrix this week and just explained to them that um, they would be, I forget the year now, I don't quite have it in my head, but they will go down in history as being the only grade since I think it's 1943 that was denied their normal graduation experiences um, as, they, as they would have known them. So I say to them, you're going to be history makers and you're going to be remembered as difficult as this seems now. But the big thing for us as school is to model calmness wherever we can, 
to talk to the children wherever we can. Remember that their emotional responses are shifting constantly. It's not just one conversation. So for parents and teachers to keep the conversation going in child-friendly languages, let the children lead the conversations. Um, it's okay for us to say, I don't know. I don't know when they're going to find a vaccine. I don't know, you know if it's peaked in South Africa or not when they ask those kind of questions. But always a balanced information with a reassurance of, yes, scientists are working. But we do know that we have a God who is in control and who loves you so much and um, who is so committed to your well-being. Um, there are many things that we can do, um, but for the, just for the purposes of time, I have found that as a, um, when we talk about flexibility, I've had to establish routines, but flexible routines. I feel like I've become a master scenario planner. If this happens, then that. If this happens, then that. And so that we can just give as much certainty as we can. Our staff need certainty. Our children need certainty. Our parents need certainty. So there are times when we have just made decisions. We can give you certainty for the next 10 days. This is what it's going to be. And this is what it's going to look like. And create the certainty whenever we can. I think with children at home, it's important for parents to create a flexible routine, but routine is important, getting up at a certain time, breaking at a certain time, you know, but not a kind of routine with color-coded flashcodes, you know, not that, not that kind of um, routine. The antidote to the excessive screen time that our children are experiencing at this time, the antidote to screen time is outdoor time. So wherever we can, we give the children extended break periods. Um, and it's probably not the time to demonize um, screen time completely, but we all know the dangers of screen time and just to encourage outdoor time. Um, I just want to say that it's important for us in our scenario planning, in our scenario budgeting, in our staffing to prepare for a number of alternatives and not be taken by surprise by whatever comes. You know, blessed are the flexible, for they will not be bent out of shape, or they will not be broken. And so may we, may we, I think many of us as educators, and I speak for myself, we like the routine, we like the order, we like the control. And this is a time when we have to say to the Lord, we are completely out of control, but we trust you in this. And in my concluding moments, um, you might have wondered why I shared about my daughter. In my concluding moments, I want to just do a full circle loop and bring us to that place. And just to say, where is God in all of this? Where is God in our leadership? Where is God in our loss? Where is God in our emotional corona coasters that we are on? And um, when my daughter died, I had already experienced, it was a family, we had experienced a number of losses before that. And so I didn't, um, I had dealt with the bigger pictures of the fact that I knew that God loved me, that I knew that God was in control of our lives, that I knew that he was a father, that he had a perspective that I didn't have. But when my daughter died, um, my emotional energy didn't so much go into the God, where were you? when she was hit by this drunk driver and left on the road for 40 minutes. Where were you in that time? It didn't so much go to that place as to a place of um, what now? How can we live well now? How can we journey our grief well? And even though I didn't ask that question so much of the Lord this time, and it's fine if we do ask those questions, but this time I didn't so much. But the Lord answered me anyway, and he answered me in the most surprising way. Um, we've obviously been thrown into legal spaces. And the one day I got an email from a lawyer who just said this. He said, um, Debbie, I know that you have wept many tears. And I know that your whole community has wept many tears over the loss of your lovely Tatum. But he said, I felt prompted to go to the this, this site of where the tragedy had taken place this morning. And he said, when I was there, this thought came to my mind that although you have wept many tears, the first tears that were ever wept were those of Jesus because he was there. And, you know, I just thought that's exactly right when, when I read this. I just thought, you know, he had been with her and her from conception through her life. He had been with her. He is with her in eternity. Why do I think that he wasn't with her in this season? 
And so I want to encourage you that as you navigate this time of difficult emotions, difficult decisions, difficult lots of things, that you would know that he is closer than you think. He hasn't left us. He hasn't forsaken us. He is with us. He's with us to help us with our emotional ups and downs. He's with us to help us in our leadership at this time. He is right there. And so in conclusion, I'd like to say, just bring us back to the scripture, that we have this hope, which is an anchor for your soul. I have a coffee mug, which has got me through this, these last two years of my life. And there I am just drinking out of it whenever I need to. And the coffee cup reminds me always that we have a hope which is an anchor for our souls. And so even as we talk about emotional ups and downs, may your soul be anchored, not because of the government, not because of infection rates, not because of um, anything else, but because we have a father who loves us, who cares, who's with us, who will never leave us or forsake us. Well, thank you so much for having me and bless you all.